All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey guys, on the line, it's our old friend Eric Brakey, former state senator from Maine. And then he was the something or other over at the Young Americans for Liberty for a long time. And then uh, he was a uh, state representative there in New Hampshire. And now he's the head of the Free State Project. He's always doing some kind of anti-government thing. Welcome back to the show. How you doing, man? Hey, doing well, Scott. I, it's it's actually I haven't been in the New Hampshire legislature. Oh. Maybe in the future, who knows? I'm still in the Maine State Senate, but I'm finishing up my third and final term. As I have started a new job at the Free State Project, I know it's all over the place. It's very confusing. I should and, have asked and- you before I started <laughs> claiming things. Thought it was I was trying to get over the cognitive dissonance in my brain about you being the New Hampshire guy. So then I had it when you left Texas, you went to New Hampshire instead of back to Maine. But that's not right. You went back to Maine and got I your seat back, back Maine. in Maine. And yeah, then back, now I, I, you're wrapping up politics on that yeah. level and you're doing the Free State Project instead. Yeah, I actually I'm here at the Maine State House right now. I stepped out of gotcha. a committee meeting so I could talk to my good friend Scott Horton. Oh, good. Well, it's so good to talk to you again, man. So tell yeah. me. There's huge news coming out of the New Hampshire there that uh, you guys, first of all, have some humongously sized House of Representatives. Uh, And in that humongously sized House of Representatives, y'all passed Defend the Guard legislation. So first, tell me that story. But more importantly, tell me the story about how you guys are going to ram this thing through the Senate. And there's nothing they can do to stop you. And the governor is going to feel like Dan Patrick and uh, Greg Abbott felt when it came to constitutional carry here in Texas that, geez, we would love to kill this thing or veto this thing, but we just can't. And again, going to have to sign the thing, Eric. And what are you doing to make it all come true, pal? I mean, isn't it an exciting time to be alive fighting the war machine? Hell yeah. You know, 20, 20 plus years, you know, since... Uh, since this whole war on terror started, we're still in all of these forever wars. And for the longest time, people thought, hey, you know, let's go petition Congress to exercise their constitutional responsibility to declare war. And Congress, year after year after year, says, yeah, that's nice, buddy, but we kind of like it this way. We kind of like not having, uh, you know, any uh, direct accountability for this. Let's just let the executive branch decide. Our hands are clean and we get all the donations for our campaign for the military industrial complex. And our constituents can't really get mad at us because we didn't vote for the thing, right? And so that's the pattern we've been in for decades until, you know, it's it was, a, I think, the first time, the first two times this idea came forward in state legislatures in Maine in 2011 by Representative Aaron Libby and uh, down in West Virginia by uh, Pat McGeehan a few years later, this defend the guard idea. What if we don't need to go to Congress to bring our at least our state National Guard home from these wars that Congress has not declared? What if we use the power of the Tenth Amendment with the ideas of nullification and the constitutional power that state legislatures, that states have over their own state National Guards, which collectively account for nearly 50 percent of active duty troops on the ground in these wars in the Middle East for the last two decades? Well, you know, I don't know how it went in West Virginia the very first time it was put forward, but I know in Maine in 2011, it came to the floor and it got 13 votes out of 151. 13 votes. Well, fast forward a decade, momentum has been building. I know in Maine, I sponsored it, it this this past year. We were I was glad we got uh, a third of the House. You know, it's a big improvement from 13 votes to get over 50, uh, but still fell very far short. But in New Hampshire, of course, with the Free State Movement, which, of course, I'm now the proud executive director of the Free State Project, as people have been concentrating libertarians in New Hampshire, the live free or die state, this is working to advance liberty policy because you get 
libertarians who are being elected as Republicans to the state house. They're pushing, you know, real li liberty policy like defend the guard. And here you have it, a bipartisan majority passes defend the guard over 200 state representatives, mostly Republican with a few progressive Democrats to overcome the neocons who still are in the party um, who voted no on this thing. Past the House of Representatives, I imagine that folks kind of collected jaws dropped. And in fact, I just had an interview on my new show, The Porcupine Report, which I'd love to have you on sometime, Scott, uh, with, uh, with Representative Tom Mannion, who is a new state representative, actually just moved to New Hampshire like within the last few years from Massachusetts, got elected to the state legislature two years after getting elected. He's a, he's a retired Marine, and he was his first term in, he was agitating for uh, Defend the Guard and working to get Democrats on board. And yeah, it's it's monumental when you see that this just passed the Arizona Senate last year, the New Hampshire House this year. Yes, it goes on to the uh, the New Hampshire Senate. That's going to be uh, that's going to be a hurdle. There's a lot more kind of the old good old boys establishment club in the uh, in in the Senate, uh, but there's a lot of excitement in New Hampshire. Um, I imagine that the public hearings for this are going to be packed um, uh, because um, I mean it's. It would be monumental if, if New Hampshire became the first state to call home the troops from the wars that Congress doesn't care enough to sign their names to. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So can you tell me about the organizational force that the Free State Project and Bring Our Troops Home and others brought to bear in order to get it through the House? Was it just because there's so many Free Staters in the House and so it was just easy or... Did you guys really like get it yeah. done? And is that same machine you put together to push it through yeah. really ready to take on the Senate now? Well, the free staters in New Hampshire are really one of the big driving forces behind this. Of course, working with great national partners like Bring Our Troops Home and Diego Rivera, who's I know hopping state to state working this. But yeah, free staters in New Hampshire, both in the House and as activists, you know, kind of uh, showing up and contacting their legislators and making their phones explode, their emails explode, and uh, really feeling the constituent pressure there. Uh, that's how you get the wrong people to do the right thing. You make it politically expedient for them to do the right thing. It's, it's great that we've got, I mean, as far as if you're liberal and kind of how you count libertarians in the New Hampshire House, you could count up to maybe about 100 out of 400, about a, a quarter of the body, which is a really great place to be. Um, uh, as far as free staters, like defined free staters, maybe there's about 40 there. Uh, but having those folks who are really principled to work the inside game, even if they're not a majority, that helps create a lot of momentum and a lot of push inside the system. But then you also need those people who are willing to show up to the public hearings, who are willing to put the pressure on their legislators and let them know, you know, this is the right thing to do. And if you want to get reelected, probably should listen to us. Yeah. Well, and it really is a nationwide movement. I mean, they just had hearings the other day in Maryland um, that, unfortunately, I missed my chance to testify uh, for reasons. But, um, you know, uh, I guess they say it's going to be 30 states this year. Do you know what the number is? Oh, I don't know the number off my head. I mean, I'm. Uh, it's. Um, I know that the folks that bring our troops home have really been coordinating this across the states. I mean, yeah. I, I've... Uh, uh, it's really been it's really been great to see kind of having that kind of national organization that can coordinate this across all the different states. I mean, they need people on the ground who can really work work it in the states like the free state movement has here. Yeah. Um, but and going back to the first thing you said there, Eric, is how exciting this is because of how real it is that it's one of the things left over from the old law that they haven't been able to completely get rid of the. Right. outright structure of the form of the union like a lot of that is still left and the governors do have you know constitutional authority not just statutory but constitutional authority over their state militias national guard yeah. units as they're called but you know there is uh and then also of course even just the the public relations of it happening, especially if we get it passed in, in different states, I think we could probably foresee a circumstance where some states pass and sign this law and then it really comes down to it and the president says, Governor, give me those 
god dang troops and then maybe the governor would have to back down i don't know maybe wouldn't challenge them at wartime but it'd be interesting to at least have that contest and see and force the president to have to work that hard for it. If you're willing to work this hard, Mr. President, to come and get our National Guard forces and break our law, why don't you just go to the Congress and have them pass a declaration then? That's what the Constitution says they're supposed to do anyway, right. you know? Right. But yeah, it's time to force the issue. And it's, as you say, well, there's you can bark up the wrong tree all day trying to get the House and the Senate to see it your way. But having the state governments interpose in this kind of a manner and yeah. on behalf especially of a movement led by veterans of our current terror wars in the Middle East coming home and talking about it's not fair to make the next generation of guys do this. And look at the yeah. three that just were killed in Jordan. They were National Guard soldiers yeah. from yeah, Georgia. Terrible. And one of them a girl. A young woman, but like, oh no, this whole Never thing is so crazy. You look at the pictures of the three of them. It was like, what were they doing in Jordan anyway? And you know, it's at the Al Tanf base or break off of the Al Tanf base right there, straddling yeah. the border of Syria and Iraq. But yeah, anyway. Well, uh, I well, you know, I know. Um, I don't know if you ever got a chance to meet when. Um, I know when you, you testified up here, in, you know, in Maine, uh, when uh, we were having the defend the guard hearings last year. A good friend of mine who was kind of the driving force behind Defend the Guard on the ground, uh, uh, retired um, uh, from the Maine Army National Guard, Sergeant Aaron Rollins, um, who uh, very unfortunately passed away recently. Um, oh, but I'll always, well, yeah, it, it was a great loss to us all. Uh, but I always remember coming out of that public hearing, you know, and you were you were zooming in for that. And you remember that adjutant, the adjutant general, and it was all the concerns about, well, if we do this, you know, what if the federal government takes away our money as if there's not a higher moral principle at stake? I mean, even the, the money, char the, the charges of losing money, um, it's overblown. There's a lot of legal protections. The president can't just like flip a switch and take the money away. Um, but I just remember walking out of that public hearing and just Sergeant Rollins turning to me and saying, you know, all these folks who are worried about money, I wish, you know, he had lost a very good friend when he was over in Iraq. And I think that he, um, you know, as he told me, he was supposed to be in the, in the seat that day that his buddy was in when he got, um, well, when he didn't make it. And, uh, and I just remember Aaron Roll, uh, Sergeant Rollins just turning to me and saying, you know, I, all these folks were talking about money. I wish they would tell that to my, my, my buddy's mother, look her in the face and say, you know what? It's okay that your boy died because the state got a few million dollars out of the deal, right? There's a higher moral principle at stake than yeah. just, oh, uh, how do we maximize money coming in from the federal government, which I know is what right. state legislators are always concerned with is maximizing those federal dollars. But, you know, if, if, if the state was paying, uh, let's say the issue was different. Let's say it was abortion and you were talking to pro-life people, right? And they said, well, you know, I, I know that you're against pro-life, but what if the federal government paid us a million dollars for every baby that got aborted? Would, would, that, be, would that be okay? It's like, no, pro-life people are going to say, I don't care how much money you're paying us. It is wrong to kill a baby, right? And for us in the Defend the Guard movement, it is wrong for our soldiers, our National Guardsmen to be deployed in, war, deployed in wars with no clear mission, with no end in sight, and without a congressional declaration of war. Yeah. Well, you know, Diego Rivera himself said something like that to the state legislature here in Texas. He said, you know, my friends came home in a box. I can't believe I just heard you say the word money. Did you just say money? And they were like, okay, he was, he might have been hollering. But point being... They were busted. They were just as red-faced as could be. Yes, they did just say money. But they didn't realize that this ranger who'd been to Rock War II the hard way and back was going to be the next guy to talk. Yeah. And, you know, with these, these particular state politicians, this was back, I don't know, two, three years ago, something... I think, Eric, there was still a little bit of a shine on, like, 
yeah, but we were setting the Iraqi people free or like there was some kind of like good underlying this. Whereas, you know, I think much more accurately, many more state representatives across the country understand now that money is really all they have to fall back on. They don't have the idea that, look, this was a noble sacrifice. It's terrible that those soldiers died, but they signed up to do the right thing for those poor people over there. And boy, they died right. trying. Like, no one believes that anymore. Not after all of this. When they literally have nothing to show for it that anyone could articulate in any way. Yeah. You know, other than just the sacrifice itself seems noble to fall in battle somehow. Like, this is some medieval virtue, you know. Um, yeah, the, the, the hypnotic spell, the neocons, you know, cast on the nation 20 yeah. years ago is all but shattered. Yeah, exactly right. So there did seem to be a little bit of that left in like, well, geez, you're not really challenging the whole thing. But like, no, that, you know, quite frankly, that is premise one of what we're talking about here is now that it's 20 years later, uh, you know, 20 years straight of this. But we have this hindsight and we know we should have never done any of this. Yeah. Like we should all agree that like, boy, wouldn't it have been different and better if W. Bush had to climb that hurdle of one on one convincing these state governors to give up their guard units for an aggressive war against a non-aggressive, not yeah. even power, barely even a state over there in Saddam Hussein's Iraq circa 0203 or force the Congress to take responsibility. And, you know, I've looked, if anyone can find this online or if anyone has the file saved, please send it to me because I can't find it anywhere online anymore. You can find some quotes of it. But Ron Paul was on the House Foreign Affairs Committee in the fall of 02. And while they were debating the authorization to use military force, he introduced a declaration of war in the committee. And then he said, I'm going to vote against it. And I urge you all to vote against it too. But if you're going to vote for the authorization for the war, then I urge you to be man enough to obey the law and vote for this declaration and take responsibility for your actions. And chairman Henry Hyde, who people might remember as the guy who had uh, overseen Bill Clinton's impeachment, he told Ron Paul, and there used to be video of this. You could find, I mean, it should be on C-SPAN. I couldn't find it. I really did look. Mm -hmm. But Henry Hyde tells him, well, we don't go by that part of the Constitution anymore. It's an anachronism. As though that's yeah. part of the Constitution, that you can just decide that some parts of this thing are just expired and not have any further reason you have to articulate why it's no longer the law that binds the power of the government that it creates. I guess that's what it means to have a living constitution, right? Yeah, One that can, it's uh, dead. Live it's exactly and what it die, means. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just by not exercising it. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the arbitrary power that we increasingly do live under if we just rely on trying to change things at the national level. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, one thing that I, I keep thinking about as New Hampshire passed this in the House and it goes to the Senate, I keep thinking about because this is a quotation that I use when arguing for defend the guard, you know, in the in the main Senate um, on multiple occasions is this quote from Daniel Webster, right, who was U.S. Secretary of State. But he was from New Hampshire and he predicted it over a century ago. He said there will come a time when the states have to interpose between their militias and arbitrary power wielded by the federal government. And here we are. It's like he called it. Right. So I, I don't care. I don't care what state goes first. I just want it to happen. Yeah. But if it's New Hampshire, that is the first to get this done and to call the New Hampshire National Guard home from these wars that Congress will not declare. It will be very poetic. And I'm sure that Daniel Webster will be proud. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, I've seen enough of these hearings and been to a few of them. Um, but um, I've seen enough of them to know that the arguments for it really are just totally hypothetical. Like, well, you know, 
the Pentagon thinks that we're not reliable, then they just won't give us any Apache helicopters at all or whatever. But meanwhile, there's no Apaches anywhere that you need Apache helicopters to shoot at to keep at bay anywhere, right? Because they already lost a long time ago. So, um, you know, they don't ever really get around to yeah. the original question of um, why it would be so necessary for them to be integrated with the national government, which has its own standing army already. And right. when, you know, at most they should be assigned to be, you know, in the rear helping provide supply or something, not having to go die on the front lines like army infantry when they sign up supposedly to sandbag flooding rivers and help deliver first aid during earthquakes and stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is a, um, well, it, and I think that so many of the arguments kind of rest on this idea that, uh, you know, I hear this in every state, you know, well, we don't want to be the first, if we're the first, then we'll be singled out and targeted by Washington DC and they'll come after our money and all of this. Um, but they ignore the fact that this isn't happening in one state. This is happening in dozens of states. And some states right. are getting further along in the process. New Hampshire, Arizona have gotten the furthest, right? But you know that the moment one state passes it, that whole dam is going to break, right? They're not going to be alone because everyone is just w watching around, scared of being the first. But everyone is getting a sense in these state legislatures, at least they're getting the sense from their constituents, that um, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong with how our troops are being treated. There's something wrong with the total lack of emission. There's something wrong with the fact that there's nothing to show for two decades of wars that have just resulted in disaster and wasted treasure and wasted blood. And, and there are no excuses left anymore other than, well, if we're the first, they might take our money away. But good luck on them taking money away from, you know, five states, 10 states, 20 states and defunding national guards across the country. You know, you can try to gang, the federal government try to gang up and bully on one single state. Still, you know, we all know what the right thing to do, even if we were going alone. But yeah. no state legislature is going alone in this. It, it is happening across the country. Yeah. And I do want to. Uh, and look, just wait, add, uh, yeah. worst case scenario, too, they take your money away and then what? You don't have Apache helicopters anymore, but you never needed that. You know, right. like I, that's the whole thing of it is. You know, if you fly around the country and you see all of the expensive planes and helicopters sitting around at American airports, military ones, National Guard ones, especially at American airports around the country, it's all just a money hole. They don't need any of that. If, if those C-130s are really for something, then transfer them over to the Air Force who can use them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the whole thing is just payoffs anyway. Remember Bernie Sanders uh, from Vermont, who's supposedly some kind of peacenik, but not if you know his record. But anyway, voted for the F-35 because Vermont is getting welfare payments in the form of F-35s deployed to their to sit at their airports to be yeah. essentially financial ornaments, right? The, the plane itself is a turkey. The whole point is it's a transfer payment from the national government to Vermont and to Bernie Sanders donors. And everybody knows it, too. It's called the American way, right? Like, well, what are you talking about? Yeah, just one big money laundering scheme. Yeah, Henry Clay's American system. It's the same thing going on right now. Yeah. Well, one thing I would say, if folks want to know, obviously, we're going, there's going to be a, a, a real fight for this in the Senate in New Hampshire. I know I'm going to be on my program, The Porcupine Report, which is going to air a new episode every Wednesday. And you can find it on all the different social media channels for the Free State Project. Uh, but if you also, so if you want to learn more about the effort in New Hampshire as that moves forward, you can check out our show there. Uh, but also, if you'd like to, if you've ever thought about visiting New Hampshire and um, and seeing the, the Free State community, uh, we've got... Um, one of our great activists on Defend the Guard is uh, Derek Frew, and he's going to be giving a whole briefing and a whole kind of talk at the upcoming uh, New Hampshire Liberty Forum, uh, March uh, 15th through the 17th. By the way, we're also going to have Glenn Jacobs speaking, you know, mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, and WWE wrestling superstar. He's awesome. Also going to have Brian Kaplan of George Mason University. 
but particularly defend the guard. You can come here, Derek Crew speak right. speak on that. If you want to get a ticket, that's at nhlibertyforum.com. nhlibertyforum.com. That's great. And Derek is a really great guy, and I know he's worked extraordinarily hard on this. So that's really cool. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to travel up and sit in the audience. I know you got a book one. to work on. Yeah, you know, I got a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs. But um, well, I, I hope it's done in time for Pork Fest, so you can come and join us. Uh, I, June. I also hope that uh, I don't know, but I'm I'm not even going to talk about the deadlines anymore. No more deadlines. I'm going to stress myself to death. The rest of my hair is going to fall out. Um, but uh, the last of it, I guess I meant to say. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Let me tell you about Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. Who knew artificial bank credit expansion leads to price inflation and terribly distorted markets. If you've got any savings left at all, you need to protect them need to put some, at least, into precious metals. Well, Roberts & Roberts can set you up with the best deals on silver, gold, platinum, and palladium, and they've been doing this since 1977. Hey, if you just need some sound advice about sound money, they're there for you, too. Call Tim Fry and the guys at 800-874-9760. That's 800-874-9760, or check them out at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. You'll be glad you did. Hey, y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's scotthortonshow.substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? scotthortonshow.substack.com. Hey, y'all, libertasbella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things including the great Top Lobster's designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's libertasbella.com. Um, but yes, I, I will be at Pork Fest either way, because I love Pork awesome. Fest so much. Uh, it, one way or the other. It, would, it wouldn't be Pork Fest without you, Scott. Oh, well, that's very nice. I've only been there a few times, so I know it precedes me by a hell of a lot. But I, I like going to it and and uh, seeing good friends there. Um, and look, uh, and the whole Free State Project is a great movement as well. It's uh, too cold for me because I'm a Texan and I'm really skinny. But um, I like it there in the summertime. And I do think it's great that so many libertarians are up there and are working together to roll yeah. back state power. And, um, well, you know, the the gun thing has come up. Mm. You really were instrumental in pushing through constitutional carry in May. That's right. And this is a, a hugely important issue for liberty in America. And it's passed in, I have no idea how many states, but I do know this, man. I, and I referred to this kind of earlier, alluded to it, that when it came to constitutional carry in Texas, where we've had concealed carry since the 90s, that was how Bush got elected, was promising not to veto it and to sign it when uh, his Democratic predecessor, Ann Richards, had vetoed it twice. So thanks a lot, Ann Richards, for birthing George W. Bush's political career to the world. All you had to do was stand up for our rights and everything would have been fine. But anyway... No, everything would have been terrible, but we'd have much peace less in the Middle worse. East right now. We we would have had the horrifying Al Gore instead of the horrific W. Bush, but it couldn't have possibly been as bad as it was. But anyway, <sighs> um, God dang Ann Richards. But point being, it's Texas, and we've got our gun rights. And you know, when I was a kid, you could have armed rifles in your truck, but they had to be displayed in the window. They were uh, accessible, they had to be visible rather than concealed, but they've been loosening and loosening and loosening gun laws, but they finally pushed constitutional carry. And by they, I mean the people of the state and their organized groups. And it wasn't the NRA. So NRA really represents like the police lobbies and that kind of thing. The arms manufacturers who they prefer their captive, um, customers in the form of police forces and that kind of thing. So they're very close with all the police unions and their point of view. But it was really just grassroots gun owners and their groups. They just, I don't know who to give credit to. Forgive me for not naming everybody because I really don't know who all it was. I'm very peripherally interested in it, but I could see yeah. it happen. 
where I know I, I, I was there when it happened because young America. I was oh, that's right. You American. were here in Texas at the time. Okay. So you finished yeah. telling the story then, because what the part that I'm trying to get to is that you and other people that you're about to talk about and give credit to, uh, forced Dan Patrick, who's the, basically the prime minister of Texas, right? The Lieutenant governor, but who holds yeah. all the power in the, in the Texas Senate, um, force him and force governor Abbott to, let that thing through and to sign it over their dead bodies and the wishes of their friends, the police unions, et cetera, like that. Ain't that right? And tell us the story how that happened. Because I think that's such a model for like, see, yeah. when it really comes down to it, if you're organized and pissed off, like, say, for example, gun owners can who are real single issue gun guys can say, yeah. absolutely not. This is our line and we're fighting about it now so we don't have to fight about it later and they're willing to go to the map for it, they win, they get their way. So it can happen sometimes, not that I'm saying the magical power of democracy, but I'm saying if people really will start with over my dead body, they really can get pretty far sometimes. And you're really the proof of that because now you're going to talk about Texas and Maine where you got done in both states. <laughs> well, you know, it, it is funny you bring it up because I remember a few years back, I was talking with Dan McKnight and I told him, you know, I really think that defend the guard is the new constitutional carry, right? What we pulled off with constitutional carry, um, it takes time and it takes time to build momentum, but state by state, what happened with constitutional carry is what was amazing. I mean, you go back to 2004, right? I think that's when you get like Alaska passing constitutional carry. And then, you know, it's like, you have always had Vermont, then you get like Alaska, Arizona. It's just a few states popping off little by little. Forgive me, years, just a second. Forgive me, just a second. I never said what it was. We just kind of assume everybody knows what we're talking about. But this is basically unrestricted carrying of firearms by anyone over yeah. 18, essentially. No no more permits, concealed or open, whatever you got, right? Yeah, uh, pr usually particularly with handguns. You can carry a handgun, you can carry it concealed, and you don't need a dang permission slip from the government to do it. Right. So uh, and different states have slight variations on it. In Maine, sadly, they set it at the age of 21. New Hampshire, it's 18. You know, there's different variations, but fundamentally, it's you're an adult and you're not legally prohibited from owning a firearm. You can carry it. You can carry it concealed. And you don't need that permission slip. Um, so, you know, by the time we got to Maine in 2000 and um, this was 2015, right? Uh, in 2015, we became the sixth state in the country to pass constitutional carry, and we passed it. Uh, you know, I was in the Senate. It was my first term. We passed it through the Democrat-controlled House, the Republican-controlled Senate. The Republican governor signed it into law. Um, we're still the only state in, in America to ever pass it through a Democrat-controlled chamber. And we did that just the same as it happened in New Hampshire, just the same as it happened in Texas. It wasn't by it wasn't because we were so nice to the politicians. And we were so persuasive with our, you know, oh, please, Mr. Politician, will you please, you know, see reason and, and hear from us? I mean, there's some degree of that, you know, carrot and stick approach, right? You've got the carrot and say, hey, here's the arguments. Here's the reasons why. But ultimately, at, at the end of the day, with something controversial like that, you got to have the stick. And the stick is we know people in your district who will vote against you. And they are calling. They are emailing. They are putting pressure on you saying you better vote to protect our rights or else we're gonna be working against you come re-election season. That's that's the threat. And that's that's democracy. I mean, that's how democracy is supposed to work. That's why we have these accountability structures and that we elect these people and we can just as easily unelect them. So that we did that model of confrontational politics in Maine. It worked, it passed. Uh, Texas was actually way behind the eight ball for all their reputation of being, you know, it, it was funny in Maine hearing people say, we can't pass this, we're not, we're not the wild, wild west. We're not Texas. I said, Texas? Texas doesn't even have constitutional carry. You don't know what you're talking about. And the wild, wild west, I mean, like Vermont is kind of west of us, right? And they don't <laughs> seem that wild. <laughs> but anyway, so, so, but Texas, of course, is a bigger nut to crack because it's a much bigger state. The politics are, <laughs> it's, uh, it's big league politics in Texas. But it was the same model. And you had groups like Young Americans for Liberty, you had the National Association for Gun Rights and their local affiliate, I believe, is called Texas Gun Rights. And it was just the same thing, right? Mobilizing people, identifying people, 
outside of the Capitol, inside people's districts, and connecting them with their legislators so their legislators feel the heat. And it took some time. It took a lot of a lot of times up to bat, but eventually it did get passed. And this has been the same model that has worked in mm-hmm. state after state. And to now, I don't even know how many states we're at right now. I know it's over half of the states in the country and over half the population of the country. Yeah. Uh, last I checked, I think Florida was number 25. Uh-huh. Um, and um, there maybe there have been a few since then. I've been focused on Defend the Guard. <laughs> uh, uh, so if there have been more constitutional carry states popping off, I, I'm, I'm not as totally up to date there. Yeah. Well, you know what? I took Texas government in government school and again in government junior college. And I had a really great teacher actually in uh, junior college on uh, in my Texas government semester there. And one thing I know is how powerful the lieutenant governor is. And a big part of that is the legacy of northern occupation after the Civil War was they wanted a completely weak governor and all the power to be in the legislature. So that's why I refer to him as like the prime minister. He really does rule. And then the point being there is that the lieutenant governor's opinion is what decides everything. It's what decides Mm -hmm. whether things get on the calendar committee at all, much less passed through. And the idea that the people of the state of Texas could force the lieutenant governor to do something he doesn't want to do is unheard of that I know of. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't pay that close attention to Texas politics, but basically, no, that's not how it works. How it works is you cry all day and then the lieutenant governor does what he wants, period. And then, right. But I know that in this case, it wasn't like that. I know that Dan Patrick, I read enough things about it that he and the governor were trying to figure out a way to stop this thing, but they couldn't stop it. They had to bow down to it. So I don't know like exactly what, what you guys yeah. did. But I know that they felt it was the numbers. It had to have just been the sheer numbers of people oh. communicating with them that, man, we're organized. We've got your name and you're going to yeah. not be lieutenant governor never again after this. Boy, I tell you what. And just he started to believe them. Right. That like, uh oh, this is really my political future here. There's no other explanation for it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is the um, you don't rise to that level without being a man of ambition. And you're always got your eyes on the next thing, right? Well, it's and a the big last thing- state, meaning that any one of us has very little power. You know what I mean? It's not. Right. It's the kind of place where big machines and big interests have power, and regular Joes right. really don't. Compared to, especially because it's such a, there's so many very rich and powerful industries here as well. There are a lot of yeah. interest groups who need. And even the government employees, too. The government in Texas is huge. So all those cops, man, all their unions and all of that, it's incredible. And as as hard as it is to lobby like an individual congressman, like a state Senate seat in Texas is bigger than a congressional seat. Right. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's an interesting way to think about it. I didn't really (laughs) think about that way. But yeah. So in other words... I guess what I'm trying to say is extra double credit to the people who got this done. Yeah. Because you don't get yeah. in Texas, you don't get to tell the lieutenant governor what to do. Like, you know, you may have yeah. whatever fraction of a choice in who your lieutenant yeah. governor is, but that's about it, you know? But yeah, no major credit there too is the folks at Young Americans for Liberty, folks at Texas Gun Rights, folks at National Association for Gun Rights. I really just showed up at the tail end and showed up to you know, at the public hearing and said, hey, you know, this has worked out really well in Maine. <laughs> they said we were going to become the most dangerous state and, you know, blood would run through the streets and all that. Instead, we became the safest state in America. And, you know, maybe it'll work out well for Texas, too. And I think it has. Yeah. Um, so um, so major credit credit to them, though. It is kind of it has been kind of nice to be uh, in some ways. I, I feel like sometimes I'm like Forrest Gumping my way through kind of history and the liberty movement, you know. You're doing great, man. <laughs> Take that credit. You're doing good. Um, well, you know, I know they all valued your help, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, I will say, you know, I want to give credit to you on one thing. You know, one of my favorite moments of, like, of, like, history to have kind of been there for, and this is where I kind of really felt like um, Forrest Gump a little bit, was, you know, I was on the Republican National Platform Committee in 2016 representing the state of Maine. And because I listened to the Scott Horton show and because I've read so many of your, your books and hear the interviews that you do, 
Um, I was on the national security subcommittee because I was like, let me go fight with some neocons, right? And I opened it up in this platform and they say, this is 2016, mind you, you know, Trump is just getting the nomination. Who knows if he's going to become president or not? I'm opening it up and there's this whole section about like, we want to give weapons to uh, to uh, Ukraine to kill Russians in this in this uh, in the, the the Donbass region. Now at that point, I didn't know a whole lot about you know all of this, but I just reading this and it's like, well, that sounds like a really bad idea. Like, why would we be doing that? Well, why are we going to put this in our platform? And um, and ended up <laughs> anyway. I think history has vindicated me, but I only had those sensibilities, Scott, to be able to question all that and to create kind of this. A little bit of a, a firestorm there. Wait, because tell I that story. To the Scott Horton show. Wait, wait, tell that story because this is a huge part of RussiaGate. Because there was a false accusation that it was the Russians who intervened to change that, and then it turned out that it was some lady. But you're not some lady. You're some other part of yeah. that same discussion. It sounds like. So tell us more, please, if you can. Yeah, like, I was this just is there, going in my and... next book, dude. <laughs> word for word. So choose yeah, them yeah, carefully. That... Yeah, well, force gumping my way through history, I found myself at the center of Russia Gate. Apparently, uh, not <laughs> not realizing what I was stumbling into. Like there were no Russians in my ears. Like no, no, no Russians were coming up to me and saying, "Hey, can you do something about this?" I was just, you know, libertarian Ron Paul guy, like who happened to have like positioned himself to be on the platform committee and seeing all these like warmongery things in there and kind of raising the question and like that we should strip it out. Uh, and then the Trump campaign did come in. And um, and uh, when once I had kind of made an issue of it and said, yeah, you know, maybe we should be changing this and kind of and ultimately they negotiated something where they kind of watered it down and it was a little less explicit. It was still, I thought, pretty, pretty combative, uh, you know, in being kind of involved in that region when we shouldn't be. But um, but yeah, I, I know that kind of after the fact kind of. Um, was it that was in the steel dossier or something they kind of pointed to that incident as uh, evidence that donald trump was uh you know beholden to to vladimir putin or something and really it was just eric brakey there kind of raising a stink about it that's so interesting okay so now if if i have the record right here all they changed ultimately was the language change from lethal defensive weapons to appropriate assistance does that sound right to you? That was the change that, that they made? That, that's, that, that sounds about right. Okay. Now, unfortunately, see, I'm looking at my file here of my book in progress, and I don't have the lady's name in here. I just have the footnote. I'd have to follow somewhere. I'd have to find the right footnote and follow it. But they said, I thought I had the direct quote from her, didn't I? I guess not. They said, eventually they said it was this lady who just did it, who was just a local, but um, it would be better if I could pull her name up here so I could ask you if you remember, like, did you have any friends in this argument when you, you were know, I don't, taking it I, up with you know, them? I, Do you remember? I, I, you know, it's been, how many years has it Eight been years. Now? <laughs> yeah, time flies. I understand. Um, Let's see. All right. Well, I just Googled myself. I just Googled myself, Eric Brakey, RNC, Ukraine. And I found this Daily Beast article because there were so many reporters calling oh, me. Dope. Like, you got to send me that. You got to send me that. All right. All right. Well, uh, it's, so here it is. There were so many reporters calling me for like, you know, like years after the fact. At a certain point, I just decided to stop taking their calls. Um, but says Eric Brakey, a main delegate who identifies as a non-interventionist, said he supported the change, which was pushed in part by the Trump campaign. Quote, I guess this was my quote, I told them at the time. Some staff from the Trump campaign came in and came back with some language that softened the platform, Brakey told the Daily Beast. They didn't intervene in the platform in most cases, but in that case, they had some wisdom to say, maybe we don't want to be calling for very, very clear aggressive acts of war against Russia. So I guess they yeah. took that as like, me corroborating their kind of conspiracy oh, theory, I, but all I was... <laughs> yeah, and in fact, see, I, I have it wrong here. I don't know where I got it in my head that it was some lady. Uh, man, I think there... At least that was one of the claims at some point, but I confuse it, because what I have here in my book was that it was J.D. Gordon, a Trump campaign advisor. Was that who you discussed it with, maybe? 
Well, I, I never directly, I don't recall directly discussing it with any Trump campaign staff. Okay. Uh, I, I see in this article by the Daily Beast from back then that mentions J.D. Gordon to it. says, according to two Republican delegates, the Trump campaign efforts were led in part by J.D. Gordon, a Trump campaign official and former mm-hmm. spokesman at the Pentagon. And the, I don't remember report. ever talking to this guy. I think that I was just kind of, I raised the issue and I don't know if it was already on their radar when I was making a public stink about it or if my making a public stink about it is what made them like say, hey, maybe we should address this. Well, I hope so. That's interesting. Um, so I guess it's really not clear whether they made the change in reaction to what you had said. That's what you're yeah. saying. Okay. Yeah. And, and I will say that that's, that on the platform committee the same year, that was I was um, – also working with a um, oh, former congressman who passed away, Walter Jones, uh-huh. uh, to get in the platform to, you know, remember the big effort to declassify like the 28 pages of the 9-11 report. Uh-huh. You know, we were fighting to get that on the platform, actually got a lot of support on it, and they killed it at the last minute. But then like a day later, they declassified it. <laughs> so oh, okay. I don't know if it's related to uh, our efforts there or not, or the timing was just odd. Yeah. Well, um the um, Mueller report, I was going to say, the Mueller yeah. report, I guess, concedes that this guy Gordon made the change and it didn't have anything to do with the Russians telling him to or whatever. And in fact, it didn't even have anything to do with the Trump campaign telling him what to do. He made the change on his assumption of what they would want. Like, took it upon himself to go ahead and say, yeah, let's water this down. So it's quite possible he heard what you said and thought, that seems very reasonable. You know what I mean? And then seems just kind of in alignment it. with Trump's stated kind yeah. of policy of like. So I remember we... if you were in the Mueller report, but apparently Mueller didn't bother bringing you up because Mueller said, OK, well, we figured out who did it. And it was this guy. And he believably says He wasn't acting as an agent of anyone but his own self when he did it because he just thought it'd be a smart idea and that it's probably what the Trump guys would want if he asked them, you know, kind of a thing. So, yeah. So that's very interesting. Okay. Well, I think he just earned a walk on part of the book there, at least somewhere. I don't like. Well, I'd be honored. Even though my friend Breaky brought it up, it's not clear whether anybody was listening, (laughs) but it does still happen anyway. (laughs) You know, you can find the clips of it on C SPAN where I'm making a stink about it. Oh, really? Is that right? And then, yeah. So, what about the part where JD Gordon comes in and makes the change? Is that on there too? Well, I don't think that he was a part, I don't think he was a member of the platform committee, right? So, he wouldn't have been able to speak like during the discourse and all that. I think he was just, you know, I could be wrong, but I, I don't remember him being on the platform committee. Okay. I don't remember ever meeting this guy. So, I think he was just probably an observer from the Trump campaign who was. You know, monitoring like. Would you send me that C-SPAN stuff? I want to watch that. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll find it. And then you're the same one bugging me about when my book is going to be finished. Never (laughs) break it. You hear me? It's never going to be finished. (laughs) Leave me alone. Oh, all right, all right. Stop giving me new stuff to write. Adding stuff to it. (laughs) Um. No, this is great, man. Hey, look, the more and better I understand things, the better for me. I don't know if it'll be better for the reader. The book is 1,198 pages today. Although some of that is Israel notes I left at the bottom of the page. That doesn't count, so. Well, I hope that when you cut it down, uh, you also at one point release a fully unabridged version for all of us ready for the really deep dive. Yeah, no, there's only going to be one edited version of this thing, man, because, yeah, it's, I'm going to have to make some hard choices, I know, but I can't put stuff back in because then I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll deal with that, uh, you know, half a suicide when I get to it. But anyway, uh, I should let you go because I got to do another interview in a minute here. Um, but thank you so much for all your great work, man. I'm so appreciative of it. And I know everybody else is, and, uh, you set such a great example that like, Hey, put your, uh, rubber meets the road out there and get some work done. And you'd be amazed what might come true. Yeah. I like trying to be like, uh, Johnny Appleseed spreading Liberty across the country. Um, but, um, just a real quick reminder to your audience, you know, New Hampshire Liberty forum coming up, nhliberty.com. 
com. Get your tickets. And, and where course, is that again? What city is that in? That's in Nashua, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, we've got Glenn Jacobs, Brian Kaplan, many other great speakers. Derek Prue will be talking about Defend the Guard. Then, of course, Porcupine Freedom Festival, Pork Fest in June. Sounds like Scott Horton's going to be there. So you can get your tickets there for pork fe- at porkfest.com. That's pork with a C, not a K. If you go to pork fest with a K, you might end up getting like tickets for barbecue or something. I'm sure it'd be great, but it won't be the Freedom Festival that you want. So porkfest with a C. Dot com. That's June 17th to June 23rd. Okay. Hey, and I just realized I have a ransom condition. I'll go to Pork Fest in June if you want me there. But yeah. you got to publish my speech from last year about Ukraine that never got YouTubed. Oh, the speech like in the committee hearing? No, it was at, at Pork Fest. I did, I oh. did two. I did one on Waco and one on Ukraine, but the Ukraine one oh. never aired. Which might be because it wasn't good, but I doubt it. No, I'm just kidding. but you know. <laughs> well, uh, I'll talk to someone. I guess now that I'm the boss, like yeah, I have superpowers, go. I can go and talk to yeah, someone. Yeah, we're pulling rank we can, here. Go push someone around that for out. me there. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I would like to see it though, because I bet I said smart things about yeah, watch this summer offensive fail, which it's already failing, right? Because it would have been at the beginning of June. And me yeah. saying, see, I already told you so already, and then whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter. All right. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Hey, awesome, Scott. Thanks for taking the time. Hell yeah. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.